on the fluoridation issue. There's only public comment. Huh? There's only public comment. Well, there is. There's not a. Here you go, ma'am. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> I call this June 21st meeting of the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority to, um, to order. Um, we will have a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councillor Davis. Next item, we have um, approval of the, the minutes. I make a motion to approve the May 17th, 2017 minutes. Is there a second? Second. Uh, there's a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed, no. So the actual agenda that some of you folks have say, it says the 15th, but the correct date is the 17th that I just announced. Next item, we have proclamations and awards. We have none. Um, public comment is the next item. Our agenda should be very short this evening, so it probably take us about 15, maybe 20 minutes. So we're going to put public comment to the end of the agenda, and we're going to have a presentation on um, water fluoridation right before. So next item we have is announcements and communication. Next scheduled meeting is August 23rd at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Grego Chambers. Item B, there is a vacancy on the Technical Customer Advisory Committee. If board members have any nominations, please direct them to the online application on the Water Authority's website at www.abcwua.org. Uh, next item is the introduction of legislation. We have none, so then we will move on to the consent agenda. So on the consent agenda, we have um, three items. If there's a motion to approve the consent agenda, so moved. there's yeah. a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. Next item is item nine approvals. We have um, item A, C1721, approving the service connection agreement for the water and sewer service with THR Properties LLC at 9211 Eagle Ranch Road, Northwest. Mr. Christopher Cadena. Hello, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm presenting a service connection agreement for a second phase of a dental office located at 9201 Eagle Ranch Road. The development is doing routine connections to existing water line and sanitary sewer infrastructure. The development will be responsible for paying utility expansion charges as well as water supply charges and complying with all of our ordinances. Are there any questions for Mr. Cadena? Seeing no questions, um, I move approval of C-1721. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. Next item is item B, C-1722, approving service connection agreement for water and sewer service with JDM McMahon um, LLC for Marketplace. Christopher Cadena. Hello. <laughs> Once again, Madam Chair, members of the board, Similar to the previous one, it's also a service connection agreement. This one is for a retail development located on the southeast corner of McMahon and Unser. Uh, similar to the previous service connection agreement, this, proper, this development will also connect to existing water and sanitary sewer infrastructure as well. Be responsible for paying utility expansion charges, water supply charges, and complying with the various ordinances. Thank you. Are there any questions? There's a motion and a second for approval of C-1722. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. 
Next item, thank you. Uh, next item, we have item C, um, C1723, approving recommendation of investment strategy. Mr. Stan um, Alred. Uh, Madam Stan. Chairman and members of the board, um, what you have before you is um, um, a strategy that was adopted by the investment um, committee. The committee was made up of um, Councillor Jones, um, the executive director, Mark Sanchez, the chief operating officer, John Stomp. Um, um, a member from RBC Capital Markets, which was Paul Cassidy uh, and myself. Um, after um, reviewing um, our, 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 our stuff with our investment advisor, which is um, public trust advisors, um, we have the following strategy in front of you. Um, and the strategy will um, allow us to diversify our portfolio and take a lot of the money out of the banks and diversify um, about $36 million in um, treasuries. Um, we currently earn about 25 basis points um, on our investments in the bank, and this will allow us to earn between 76 to 100 basis points, so basically um, tripling um, or more um, our investment. And we um, recommend approval. Any questions? I move approval. Um, there's a motion and a second for appro approval of C-1723. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. Thank you, Stan. Next item we have is other business, and that would be the water report um, on Florida, Mr. Floyd, Mr. Mark Kelly. As Mark's making his way up here, I just wanted to let everybody know the next item will be public comment. The reason that we're discussing discussing fluoride is there was a policy amendment uh, made to our budget um, the last time we met. Um, this amendment did not provide for an appropriation, so um, um, we're just kind of gearing up for that, so this is an opportunity for public comment. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair and members of the board, I'm going to talk about uh, supplemental fluoride. Uh, the goals are to provide data for uh, our background levels that are currently in our water sources to provide uh, expected levels if um, the, uh, what you referenced, uh, supplemental fluoride is resumed, uh, to review expected costs and to have a look at a timeline for potential implementation. Uh, in 1962, the CDC came out with some guidelines of fluoride concentrations between 0.7 and 1.2 milligrams per liter was the recommended range. Um, in 2011, the EPA and the CDC announced that they were going to work together to look at potential effects of fluoride. And um, this was uh, done because it wasn't, um, the EPA wasn't sure if they were going to uh, change the recommended levels or change their MCLs. So, um, they got together and had some proposals and said that they would come out with a final level. In 2015, they did come out with a optimal level, uh, recommended level of 0 0.7 milligrams per liter. And they went to the bottom level of that range uh, due to more people using uh, toothpaste and other dental care as compared to uh, when it first got uh, put out in the 60s. We do have background uh, levels naturally occurring of fluoride in our groundwater and surface water. We do sampling quarterly at our wells, and we have a lot of data based on the last 27 years of sampling. Um, in our well water, uh, the, the background uh, levels can depend on uh, how long and how often a, a particular well is pumped. Um, the levels also vary by well field, and this uh, shows you the different concentrations in uh, each of our well fields. Some of them are below 0 0.7, uh, some of them are above 0 0.7 milligrams per liter. Our surface water also has some naturally occurring uh, fluoride in it. It does vary slightly uh, depending on what's going on in the river, about which uh, tributary is dominant. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey uh, does quarterly samples uh, in the Rio Grande that shows that the average concentration of fluoride in there is 0 0.35 milligrams per liter. Right now, the surface and groundwater supplies are blended. Um, last year, uh, we had uh, over 60 percent uh, surface water. Um, 
It depends on our seasonal demand and the availability of surface water, what the blend actually is. Um, we do quarterly sampling in the distribution system that shows that when we are on 100% groundwater, we're averaging around 0.5 milligrams per liter. And then um, when the uh, water treatment plant is online, we're averaging between 0.4 and 0.5 milligrams per liter. Um, addition of supplemental fluoride would take place at the San Juan Chama water treatment plant. This plant is a secure facility. It's designed for handling uh, bulk storage and, and distribution of chemicals. Um, it, uh, the, what would be added would be a NSF 60 approved uh, fluorosilicic acid that most uh, places that are uh, adding fluoride are using. Um, the, the fluoride that comes in would be tested uh, to determine the actual uh, dosage rate used. Um, with the raw water having the 0.35 milligrams per liter naturally occurring level and the target of 0.7, um, we would be uh, shooting for a, a goal of between 0.65 and 0.75 milligrams per liter to come out of the plant. With uh, when the surface water treatment plant is on, it's anticipated that uh, fluoride levels would be that 0.7 milligrams per liter. Uh, when it's offline, uh, the well pumping, we would expect around 0.5 milligrams per liter, although the, the water authority would, would try to make, uh, use the wells in the, the best way possible to, to get closer to that 0.7 milligrams per liter. Um, in all cases, the expected fluoride levels uh, are going to be well below the EPA secondary maximum contaminant level of two milligrams per liter. Uh, this anticipated to cost uh, $250,000 for capital costs at the San Juan Chama water treatment plant and the operations costs in, including um, uh, capital in the future uh, are anticipated to be $250,000 a year for the fluorosilicic acid replacing wearable parts and also uh, all the uh, testing that would, would be going on. Uh, the timeline uh, upon approval uh, would be uh, to begin immediately, but uh, at the, the latest, we're looking at April uh, of next year uh, pending approval. That's all I have and I can uh, stand for questions. Are there any questions? If there's not any questions, we'll just move right into public comment. Thank you. Thank you. So um, next item is we have public comment. Ms. Jenkins, how many people do we have signed up to speak? 28. 28. So um, I think what we should do is what the 28 will be about an hour and okay so um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have um, you'll have up to uh, two minutes to speak miss miss Jenkins will you please um, call the first speaker Peter Nathanson followed by Don Schrader Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, my name is Peter Nathanson. I'm an engineer registered in the state of New Mexico. I've been doing civil and environmental engineering for over 30 years. I'm also an operator, water system, drinking water system operator certified by the state of New Mexico. Fluoride is a contaminant. Your job as the authority is to not add contaminants to our drinking water. Your job is to prevent those contaminants from entering our water and when they do, remove them when they're present at specific concentrations. I think everybody can agree that the prevention and removal steps are important. I don't believe everybody agrees that the addition of a contaminant is a good idea. 
Regardless of the EPA and the CDC's finalized guidelines for supplemental fluoride in drinking water, research indicates that supplemental fluoride is a questionable practice with adverse health implications. And some of those implications are evidenced by the EPA's longstanding decision to regulate fluoride at both secondary aesthetic effects and primary health effects. What does that mean? Okay. We also know that the efficacy of fluoride treatment for dental health is limited to when children's enamel is developing, and that's for surface surficial treatment, not systemic drinking water. Your decision to add fluoride is requiring everybody to drink supplemental fluoride, even though its efficacy is limited to those small children when their enamel is developing. If you want to really do something, repurpose the money, put it into a community-based dental health program and set up outreach and provide dental health education, partner with the Department of Health, partner with your uh, county folks, and do something that has measurable results, not systemic fluoride. Thank you. Don Schrader followed by Santiago Montoya. I have studied health for 41 years. Five of my health books plus other articles warn against the health hazards of fluoridated water. 97% of people in Western Europe do not, I repeat, do not drink fluoridated water. Sodium fluoride can cause arthritis, early aging, thyroid disease, osteoporosis. Sodium fluoride can cause behavior problems, hip and neck fractures, muscle weakness, chronic fatigue, skin rashes. Sodium fluoride can cause birth defects, Down syndrome, joint pains, digestive upset, tingling in toes and fingers, genetic damage. Sodium fluoride can cause lowered immunity, bone cancer, bladder cancer, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, stomach cancer, intestinal cancer. Are you sure that fluoridation causes none of these 22 conditions? Often educated people have sincerely thought they were right, but history proved them terribly wrong. Decades ago, a leading medical journal advertised cigarettes, and some doctors recommended cigarettes. But eventually, we found out the deadly truth. Are you sure, beyond all reasonable doubt, that all the scientific studies, all the articles and books the past 50 years damning fluoridation are totally wrong. Santiago Montoya followed by Robert Schiller. Madam Chairman, members of the board. Uh, in regards to last month meeting, is anybody trying to put their hands in, a, so to speak, in a cookie jar? Why was it, this maneuver done in the last meeting, even though it was not in the regular meeting agenda? Can you answer me? Can you answer the taxpayers honestly that question? Does anybody in the board? as a guide to really answer them, that question honestly? And I think, you know, you members of this uh, Water Authority, all of you are adults. You, each and every one of you, are supposed to set an example to the young kids, to elementary, junior high, high school, 
and beyond. Yet, by doing what you guys did at the last meeting, by trying to put in this fluoride deal underneath without even being in the regular schedule meeting. You know, what kind of example are you putting to the young kids? You, you guys are supposed to be adults. You're supposed to set an example. You People are doing a very lousy job of setting an example to the young generation. And then you wonder why the kids do what they do, because they got perfect teachers sitting back there doing the opposite. Thank you. Robert Schiller followed by Deborah Sapunar. As, as this uh, gentleman is coming up, Mark, can you just kind of talk about a process in terms of budget and amendments and how um, real quickly um, amendments can be done and that not necessarily, you know, um, when we pass something, people have different votes and. <coughs> uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, at the last meeting, as you can recall, the FY18 operating budget was before the body for approval. Uh, what was proposed and approved by the board was an amendment to that budget uh, directing uh, the authority to begin supplemental fluoridation um, and using savings from what we expect uh, in power and chemicals because of a 1.5 megawatt solar array that was recently constructed and is now operational. Um, each amendment are typically not uh, published as part of the agenda for an operating budget. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Okay, I apologize, sir. Board members, I'm Robert Schiller and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. This fluoride situation reminds me of the cell phone situation. I think they stole their idea from the fluoride people when they the World Health Organization decided to have a big massive study on cell phones and their relationship to cancers and other such things. They did this, probably one of the best studies ever done, and tabulated the results, formed a, a report, and the report said yes, cell phones can cause brain tumors, cancers, and a whole list of things, guaranteed. But could they publish this? No, they had to turn it into the World Health Organization who immediately got out the scissors and they cut out from this report everyone over 59, everyone under 25, everyone who had more than two cell phones or more than one cell phone and a whole slew of others. One scientist involved in the report said by the time they got through with this, it looked like cell phone usage made people healthier. About a dozen of the involved scientists went and wrote up a uh, protest report and signed it, but that didn't start stop the World Health Organization. They went and sent this report, all chopped up, mind you, out to people. And that's what you'll find if you buy a new cell phone. Um, it's called the Interphone Study in that little piece of paper. Well, I believe they got this from the fluoride people because they were having trouble getting all this fluoride into the water and they decided they also wanted a report. So they commissioned a report and brought the report back and the people who commissioned it took a look at it and said, I can use this. It says where we add fluoride, there's a 14% decrease in cavities. And they got their dentist buddy to tell a whole bunch of dentists and tell them to tell a whole bunch and now we know why all these dentists believe that there's a reduction in cavities because of this report. But what about the control group? Also showed 14% decrease in cavities, which proves that added fluoride does nothing to decrease cavities. Thank you. Deborah Sapinar, followed by Mark Jersick. I'm Deborah Sapinar, and I'm totally against adding fluoride to Albuquerque's water supply for many reasons, but I'll address two this evening. First, fluoride is a neurotoxin. A March 2014 report from the Lancet Medical Journal officially classified fluoride as a neurotoxin. 
This is the same category as arsenic, lead, and mercury. Second, there is no way to control the amount of fluoride each citizen will consume. We drink the fluoridated water, bathe in the fluoridated water, and eat food and beverages we prepare with the fluoridated water. In addition to pr processed foods and drinks made with fluoridated water, and don't forget the use of fluoridated toothpaste and mouthwash. A recent, recent national survey conducted by the CDC found about 40% of American teenagers with visible signs of fluoride overexposure. Infants who consume formula made with fluoridated tap water ingest 77 to 1200 micrograms of fluoride. That's about 100 times more than the recommended amount by the Institute of Medicine. In July of 2012, scientists from Harvard University warned that the developing brain may be another target for fluoride toxicity. There are also conditions that make those in our community more vulnerable to fluoride toxicity, such as living in poor neighborhoods, nutrient deficiencies, infant formula consumption, diabetes, and kidney disease. Let's not step back to the 1940s and 50s when fluoridating the water was thought to be the greatest chemical to fight tooth disease. Let us use our current day knowledge and research to realize that fluoridating our city and county water supply cannot keep teeth healthy and can cause more harm than good to the residents of Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. Mark Jersick, followed by Mariella Leba. Hello, my name is Mark Jersick, and I am opposed to the added fluoride in the water for the simple reason that the vast preponderance of statistical data simply does not support the assertion that there is any difference whatsoever between populations that consume fluor fluoridated water and those that don't. I brought with me a chart of data from the World Health Organization uh, in which is plotted versus time tooth decay rates. So it's normalized tooth decay rates versus the year the data was taken. Two things should be taken away from this chart. The first is that tooth decay rates, and by the way, each one of these lines on this chart represents the data from one country. There are 22 countries <coughs> representative here. So both in countries where they fluoridate water and don't fluoridate water, tooth decay rates are dropping and at about the same rate. The second and probably the more important conclusion is, is if you look at the data for the most recent data, you'll notice it's all kind of moshed together into a ball. If you do a statistical analysis between countries that fluoridate their water and don't fluoridate their water, the means are ide statistically identical. There is no difference in the means. There is no difference in the variance. So the assertion that there is any benefit to adding fluoride to the water is simply not statistically valid. Thank you. Mariella Leba, followed by Joe Martinez. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, my name is Mariela Leba. I am the mother of a 16-month-old son and a lifelong resident of Albuquerque. Um, and I was able to benefit from community water fluoridation. I would like the same for my son. Um, I've practiced dental hygiene for six years, four of those being um, in private practice, the last two in a uh, public health setting. Um, and I work primarily with children throughout the state. Um, in my experience, I see dental decay or cavities at a rate that is completely unacceptable. Um, primary or baby teeth are crucial to a child's speech development, confidence, and ability to obtain proper nutrition. Children also begin to get their permanent teeth as young as five or six years of age, and these are the teeth that they have to, that have to last them their lifetime. Um, here in the city of Albuquerque, we, we have more access to care and less population with a low socioeconomic status when compared to some of the rural areas that I visit. Yet the rates of dental decay are comparable. This means that we must find a way 
we must find a way to lower the incidence of cavities in the Albuquerque metro area. I believe that through proper management of optimal fluoride levels in the community water supply, we can make this happen. And I talk about the benefit um, of community water fluoridation to children um, because that's, I, I work primarily with children, uh, but there's also a topical and systemic benefit for adults as well. Um, so as a resident of the Albuquerque metro area, a mother and a customer of the Water Utility Authority, I hope that the board will vote to reinstate community water fluoridation and help to reduce oral health disparities and lower the incidence of dental decay. Thank you. Joe Martinez followed by John Martinez. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you members of this Water Authority Board. My name's Joe Martinez. I work with Health Action New Mexico. I've been a resident here in this community for 31 years. I grew up in a little mining town in southwestern New Mexico where they did community water fluoridation from before the day I was born. And our oral health uh, profile is very positive. I'm happy to be here tonight to let you know that one of the most important decisions you can make is to support the reinstatement, the resuming of community water fluoridation in this community. Two facts I wanna sh share with you. One, there are so many more communities that do community water fluoridation than those that do not. The science is there, the safety is there, and the practice is a public uh, practice that is safe and it's recommended. Finally, I wanna say one other thing, and that is that many hundreds of thousands of children will benefit from community water fluoridation resuming in this community. Please do the right thing for so many people that live in this community. I am so proud of the leadership that you as a Water Authority Board, board demonstrate. Continue that positive leadership and resume community water fluoridation, please. John Martinez followed by Wendy Fabian. Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I'm with Delta Dental New Mexico, John Martinez, and Delta Dental is uh, an insurance carrier in the state of New Mexico uh, supporting uh, our mission to prevent uh, oral health disease in the community. And because fluoride is a natural um, mineral that helps aid in the prevention of um, tooth decay, uh, primarily in children, uh, Delta Dental simply stands in support of fluoridating uh, Albuquerque's water supply. Thank you. Wendy Fabian followed by Mike Gadler. Madam Chair, members of the board, I'd just like you to consider the following questions. These are a few things that I've wondered about concerning what we're about to do, what we're looking at. How much fluoride will you be dosing me with if I drink eight glasses of water a day? Can you guarantee that none of us will suffer any harmful effects from adding this industrial grade fluorosilic silicic acid to our water? Why are we using this unpurified form of fluoride anyway? If it's such an important additive, why not a pharmaceutical grade? And since ingesting fluoride is so critical in some people's opinion, why would the FDA advise against the commercial sale of fluoride supplements? If it isn't an essential nutrient, why not? We've been adding it to municipal drinking water for 70 plus years. Isn't it common knowledge that fluoride is most effective as a topical treatment? Hasn't fluoride been proven to be a neurotoxin that blocks the fu function of iodine, which by the way is an essential nutrient? Is it really a good idea to ingest more than what is already naturally occurring? Who is profiting from this deal? Is adding fluoride a good thing 
Why stop with fluoride? I'm sure we could use the same rationale with many other things that would be much less harmful. Isn't this practice of fluoridation overreaching your civic responsibility to provide clean and safe water to your constituents? Mike Gadler, followed by Elaine Hebbard. Board members, my name is Michael Gadler. Law of unintended consequences, you see that often. I have a report here from somebody by the name of Anna L. Choi of the Department of Environmental Health, Harvard School. Anybody making a decision on anything to do with water, probably anything to do with fluoride, should probably read this. Um, the conclusion of the report is very simple. Children who live in high fluoride areas have lower IQs than controls or those who live in other uh, un unfluoridated areas. Children in high fluoride, fluoride areas have significant lower IQ scores than those who live in low fluoride areas. There is a relationship between fluoridation and IQ. That's the conclusion of this report. Um, Fluoride readily crosses the placenta. You know what that means? Do you know what that means? It readily crosses the placenta. You're going to have to put a tag on the water faucet saying, pregnant women cannot drink this water. Well, let's not talk about the lawsuits that are going to result from this thing, because they're going to be there. De um, fluoride exposure to the developing brains, which is much more susceptible to injury, caused by toxicants than is the mature brain. So the little tissue mass or whatever you want to call it that's in the womb is that brain is going to be damaged and that child is going to have a lower IQ. Children who lived in areas with high fluoride exposure had lower IQ scores than those who lived in low exposure or control areas. Don't forget that, remember that, that's very important. Now, concern for education, Finland dropped fluoridation. Do you realize, do you know where Finland is in education worldwide? Anybody know? Well, they're number one. So think about the lawsuits. That's the thing I'm going, I want, to, want you to address. When that little, that little baby is damaged, his IQ is damaged, Think about the lawsuits that are going to come to Albuquerque. And what I want you to do is set aside some money to fight those lawsuits because they're coming our way if you, if you fluoridate. Thank you very much. Madam Chair. Can I follow up? Councillor Davis. I'm sorry, sir. I just had, I, was there I had questions? A, I just had a brief question. I was actually uh, trying to look up the study you were mentioning. Oh, yes. I've given you a copy of it if I, you'd like. The one, the one I see was done on children in China relating to. That's correct. So it was Chinese, and I understand it's in, it was in relation to the study of water systems that had lead in their system, and fluoride was it's a secondary It's possible there was lead. There is n it is not known whether there is le was lead or mercury in their systems or not, just like we don't know here sometimes either. China, China was in an uh, unusual uh, situation where we could do a study. China has highly fluoridated water, naturally highly fluoridated, and so you could get control groups and you could get highly fluoridated situations um, all across by, by just reviewing studies from China. Okay. And by doing that, they were able to come up with this study. However, as you're pointing out, we don't know the level that's dangerous. Some levels in animals and rats show one part per million damages tissue. Uh, in other cases, Areas that are below what you're suggesting to fluoridate the Albuquerque water has been shown to be dangerous. I don't want to. Right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Are there any other questions? Thank you, sir. All right. E thank you. Elaine Hebbard, followed by Jesus Galvan. Could I have the overhead, Patty? Come. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Elaine Hebbard. I'm a longtime attendee of these meetings. I'm not going to talk about fluoride tonight. Rather, I'm going to talk about um, 
<coughs> the fact that May's meeting provided a, a number of examples as to why governance changes have been suggested for this board and perhaps why customer satisfaction numbers have been decreasing. As I talked about last at the May meeting, you'll notice that the J.D. Power study shows that we <coughs> were 80th of 87 large um, utilities that were actually reviewed for customer satisfaction <coughs> of more than 400,000 customers or more. The results were based on more than 40,000 responses re representing more than 87 million residential customers of the 87 largest utilities. And they were responding to 33 attributes within six major areas. What was interesting, I found out after the meeting last time, was that this year's score was slightly less than last year's. Furthermore, the lowest score was in the area of the delivery of water and reliability of service, and had one of the lowest scores in the country. The water utility also service surveys their customers. And that, what's interesting is that the questions on water availability and water delivery have also gone down. They've been 87% down to 78% in the last 10 years. So this is a perfect opportunity to discuss with your customers reasons like the fluoride, um, ways to make, raise the customer satisfaction. Um, and <clears throat> so hooray for taking the comments tonight. I think it's the right thing to do. I would like to suggest that people who weren't able to come here they were able to submit their comments on fluoride. It'd be a great thing for other people to do. I was not able to talk about everything I wanted to. I have my comments to submit tonight for the record. Thank you. Jesus Galvan followed by Patrick Manzanares. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the, of the uh, Water Utility Authority. Uh, my name is Jesus Gardelvan. I am a dentist of 44 years. Uh, I grew up here in Albuquerque, went through all the public schools, University of Mexico, went to dental school at UCLA. Um, the comments that we're hearing tonight uh, are comments about the <coughs> so-called addition of fluoride to community water systems. The whole concept of community water fluoridation is designed to, to bring a community water, a community's water into a level of optimal fluoridation. That could mean adding supplemental fluoride. And notice the word supplemental. Adding supplemental fluoride to the water to bring it up to an established level that is not harmful. In certain communities where there is community water fluoridation, it's actually removed to bring the water down, to bring the levels down in the community water system to optimal levels. Uh, as has been mentioned, fluoride is a naturally occurring element. Uh, we have it in our water. We have grown up drinking fluoride in our water in, in, in Albuquerque, in surrounding areas, and different parts of the state. Uh, I don't know that there has been any evidence showing that as a state and as a community, our um, intellectual levels have been compromised by this naturally occurring mineral. Thank you. Patrick Monsonares followed by Rudy Blair. Chair, fellow board members, I'd like to thank you all for uh, allowing us to have this public comment on this very, very important issue. Uh, my name is Patrick Monsonatis. I'm a graduate student in social work and public health. In addition to that, I've spent the last decade doing outreach in, in a m many other things, Mongol health, with uh, rural communities in the state of New Mexico. And uh, in that time, I uh, worked with a number of communities that did not have fluoride in their water systems, and we saw an elevated increase in tooth decay, 
causing what can best be described as a health inequality amongst these uh, communities. And as such, I believe it is incredibly important that Albuquerque go back to a fluoridated water system that is regulated at optimal levels. I could talk about the various uh, research, the various uh, peer-reviewed uh, papers that uh, support these measures, but there are a number of oral health care professionals coming up to speak before. But I believe that uh, making sure that uh, community tap water in the Albuquerque area is fluoridated is key to preventing this any sort of health inequality. Thank you. Rudy Blea, followed by David Manzanares. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to come before you and speak. I am employed by the Department of Health, and I am representing tonight the Department of Health's leadership in support of the action that you took in May in approving the funding for fluoridation. At the same time, I also am representing the Association of State and Territorial Dental Directors and the American Public Health Dentistry Association. They have asked me to share uh, their comment and that they support the action that you have taken and they will continue to support you in maintaining water fluoridation if you begin it in FY18. The two, the three, <clears throat> the department and the two associations are in full agreement that fluoride is a safe and effective way of providing treatment for our children as they grow up and along with adults as well. We have researched, we have studied, we have come to many conclusions about fluoridation and which side of the fence you sit on. But the department and the two so associations have followed peer review studies throughout the past 50 years and have found it acceptable to provide water fluoridation at the optimal levels of 0 0.7 parts per million. Should you continue the practice, you will join other communities throughout the country who are providing water fluoridation to their customers, and that equals millions of individuals. And if you were to go look at the individuals and their lifestyles, you will find that there are no health effects caused by over fluoridation. We may have fluorosis, but there are no chronic diseases or other disabilities that will come as a result of consuming fluoridated water at the regulated optimal level of zero parts 0.7 parts per million. Um, I have brought <clears throat> 80 signatures in support of your action to continue water fluoridation in the Albuquerque area, and these have been signed by directors of medical uh, companies, uh, medical directors, other dentists throughout the community, especially other communities that support your action. And we uh, applaud your action, and we recommend that you continue providing water fluoridation to the people of Albuquerque. Thank you. David Monsonata is followed by Lisa Roberts. Madam Chair, members of the Water Authority, thank you for your time and uh, allowing public comments on this issue. I'm Dr. David Monsonatis. I'm a general dentist practicing here in Albuquerque. I'm also uh, the secretary treasurer of the New Mexico Dental Association. This is an issue that I think we really need to get back on. Currently, Albuquerque is the second largest metro area that doesn't have fluoride optimization within its water systems. This is going to be a way to help maintain and ensure that the people of our city have access to one of the most significant public health uh, initiatives that our nation has ever seen. It is supported by the CDC. It is supported by uh, the FDA. Um, I treat a lot of Medicaid patients. I see a lot of children who come in with the, the amount of tooth decay that is just staggering. And it is, this is a way to make sure that these children do not miss school, they do not suffer pain, and that they are able to maintain a good active lifestyle. This is one of the cheapest, best initiatives that we can take, and it will help make sure that our community is healthy. Albuquerque is suffering through so many major societal issues right now, and it is important that we at least try and improve uh, our current public health model. Um, 
it, this is something that needs to be done to help improve our community. So I want to say thank you for the time and the ability to offer commentary. Madam Chair. Councillor Davis. Just very briefly, uh, Dr. Montserrat, thank you for that, uh, Montserrat, thank you. Um, but we've heard some comments tonight. I think the, the, the benefit for children as their teeth are developing, I think, is undisputed for fluoride period, however it gets there. But we've also seen some studies that folks have emailed to us about the benefits for adults as well in preventing decay. Is that in your professional experience and maybe from the association, can you give us some insight on any benefits for adults beyond sort of the developing children's stage as well? Absolutely, I see it all the time. Uh, one of the prescriptions I write the most is for highly fluoridated toothpaste. These people uh, don't have access to the fluoride and it helps cut down in the amount of caries rates, especially in areas like root caries. We're seeing with our aging population, geriatric patients are <laughs> Uh, experiencing they, the gingiva that surrounds the root of the tooth begins to recede away. And as that root surface, the cementum, is exposed to the environment of the mouth, that causes further breakdown. Because they do not have the fluoride in their water, we're seeing increased rates in decay there, which leads to teeth breaking off, which leads to f higher rates of edentulation. We're having to put patient, we're noticing that patients who never had cavities over the last four years are coming in with significant caries. Especially another comorbidity is a lot of these patients, especially your geriatric patients, they're suffering from the effects of polypharmacy, which means they're on lots of medication. The side effect of that oftentimes is xerostomia or dry mouth. Saliva is there to help clear out the mouth. What fluoride is able to do in this case is it's able to help prevent further breakdown. It also reduces a lot of cases of root sensitivity. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Roberts followed by Joe Ghirardelli. Hi, my name is Lisa Roberts and I was a preschool teacher for 20 years and we encouraged children to brush their teeth. Something that didn't really happen with kids when I was a child. A lot of parents would have them brush their teeth, but they didn't brush their teeth if they were in school or daycare, things like that. And then, well, why did that? That happened. My son was raised in an area and was in utero in an area where there was no fluoride added to the water. And surprisingly, he had no dental caries through his entire childhood. And I attribute that specifically to the fact that he had a dentist that applied uh, sealants to his teeth. Sealants prevent cavities really well, especially in the primary teeth. My daughter, on the other hand, grew up in Albuquerque under fluoridation and was in utero under fluoridation. And, you know, she suffered tremendous amount of dental caries because her dentist, instead of giving her sealants to protect her teeth, gave me bottles of fluoride rinse for her to rinse with. I agree, fluoride can really protect your teeth if it's applied to your teeth. I don't think that we should have to drink it with every glass of water. And I specifically think that with all the infrastructure that needs to happen in the city, spending the cost of two, three bedroom houses each year to maintain a fluoridation plan that many, Amer many Albuquerqueans don't want is irresponsible. We can apply fluoride to our own teeth we can get fluoride to our own teeth. And for all the dentists that say that fluoride is a big benefit, I have to say, it didn't really do anything for my daughter. What did help was the sealants on my son's teeth. What does help is to continue continually practicing good oral hygiene. And for some people, like my daughter-in-law who grew up with highly fluoridated water in Texas, her teeth are incredibly bad. You know, the fluoride often doesn't solve the problem. Joe Ghirardelli Gardi, followed by Darius Roberts. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Girardi, and I'm a, a practicing dentist here um, in Albuquerque. I grew up here. And uh, a couple points I just want to um, uh, touch on is money one way from taxpayers um, will be spent on, on oral health, health care and dental health, and it goes a lot further to prevent for a large population rather than to treat all these individuals with several dental problems and, and cavities that happen. And to address uh, Mr. Davis's question uh, previously with Dr. Manzanares, 
One added benefit that I'd like to touch on for adults um, is yes, obviously it is a, a big help to children immediately in, in preventing dental decay. Uh, but every time, you know, as a, as a dentist, I see this all the time, every time you have any kind of procedure done on a tooth, say it's a filling, say it's whatever it is, a crown, it starts that tooth kind of on a negative spiral. It's never going to be the same as what it was as a perfectly healthy tooth. You're going to have to replace that filling 20, 30 years down the road most likely, and that filling is going to get bigger, it's going to break, it's going to turn into a bigger thing, a root canal, a crown. So the most important time is to pre prevent it in the early stages of that, of that tooth and, and prevent that lifetime of problems for the adult. Um, and one other thing I'd like to say just about the support that we have as dentists, it's not helping us financially at all. It's actually hurting us. It's taking us money away from, from our industry. Um, but that goes to show how much it works, and we believe that it works for the patients because um, it's for their sake. It's not ours. Thank you. Darius Roberts followed by Ron Romero. Madam Chair, Board, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, bravo for the uh, solar array. That could uh, offset the cost of running the water plant. I'm against uh, fluoride, and the point has been made uh, excellently by the previous speakers. It, uh, the numbers I have here, it costs uh, 260000 to build the plant and 270000 a year to maintain it. Um, uh, fluoride once upon a time was a toxic byproduct of a process and they didn't know what to do with it and well let's put it in the water. At one time mercury was prescribed and for an even longer period of time it was used as tooth fillings. What uh, we think is safe sometimes down the road turns out to be not safe. Um, you know, arsenic is naturally occurring in the ground. If we add arsenic to our water, it will kill germs, kill any viruses we have. So let's add arsenic to our water too. Um, this uh, $530,000 uh, that could be better spent on our infrastructure, which is in kind of bad shape. The water uh, mains, the system, uh, we're continually uh, having to tear up streets. I just think that money could be better spent. And finally, uh, could this not be put to a vote to let the citizens decide if we want this added to our water or not. That would be my request. That and uh, taking this 530,000 and just applying it to the infrastructure. Thank you. Ron Romero followed by Tom Shrip Senna. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. First of all, I, um, I want to say that I'm the former state dental director for the uh, state of New Mexico. Uh, so Bernalillo County was one of the, the, the counties that uh, uh, my program um, provided service to and primarily preventive services. Uh, again, uh, uh, last time I was here, I mentioned that we basically have, in public health, we have two tools in our toolbox. One is, is fluoride, community water fluoride being one of those, as well as uh, sealants. Somebody talked about sealants here today. But what I want to say is that, that uh, uh, fluoride in the water works on the smooth surfaces of the teeth, and, and the sealants work on the uh, biting surfaces of the teeth. So together, they both form a, a very good uh, protective factor for fighting cavities. But without the fluoride uh, to strengthen the teeth, uh, we, we lose some of that protective factor to prevent cavities. For, uh, also, I want to talk about uh, some of the U.S. statistics. Statistics on fluoride. fluoride. There's about, uh, back in uh, 2012, and this comes from the CDC, uh, around the time Albuquerque went off, uh, there was about 75% of the U.S. population 
on, on public waters and public water systems receiving fluoridated water. 210, that translated to 210 million people. 18,502 water systems uh, were providing fluoridated water throughout the country and 44 of those largest cities, uh, 44 of them were uh, lar uh, large cities. Um, and, and for Albuquerque, uh, if, we're, if we provide uh, community water fluoridation, uh, that, that, that'll translate to less than 20 cents per person per year. Uh, that, that'll be $4 million uh, in cost savings on dental treatment per year as well. Uh, $1 invested in fluoride brings $38 in savings for dental care. So I think it's a wise idea and I, rec I, I, I uh, ask you to continue to uh, fluoridate water in Albuquerque. Thank you. Tom Shripsena followed by Robert Montanatis. Good evening, Ms. Uh, Ms. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. My name is Tom Scripsima. I'm the executive director of New Mexico Dental Association. Uh, I also am a dentist and I grew up here in Albuquerque. I had the opportunity to share my personal experience and that of my family um, in an op-ed in the paper and I'm not gonna revisit that, but I can tell you that I definitely believe in um, community water fluoridation as a solution for us. I'm really not gonna ask you to believe me either. I want you to believe um, the 45 other, you know, 45 of the 50 largest cities in the United States that fluoridate their water. Um, and the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, the American Medical Association, the American Dental Association, and the list goes on and on of organizations that have looked at the science, have looked at what there really is there and found it to be an effective method um, to prevent tooth decay and a safe method um, to prevent tooth decay, and a affordable method to treat or to prevent tooth decay. Um, and just a word about where that science comes from. Um, you know, those organizations are not selective in the way that they view the science. We use evidence. Um, evidence-based medicine is the standard by which um, we provide care. And the way, uh, the highest level of evidence that we have are, is the systematic review, which looks at not certain selective studies, but all the studies that are out there and um, rates the value of each particular study and looks at what evidence is actually there. The evidence shows overwhelmingly and consistently that it does prevent de tooth decay and that it does not cause any of the other health problems that have been um, discussed here tonight. So I'd urge you to continue along the path you've started now in terms of returning to water fluoridation. Um, let our residents have what they need. Thank you. Robert Monsonettos, followed by Mary Rose Tuhig. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity to share my thoughts here. My name is Robert Monsonatis. I'm a recently retired dentist, and, uh, but I had 37 years of private practice in northern New Mexico. I had the rare opportunity to serve people from small communities coming into my practice, and some places had naturally high occurring fluoride, and I saw pitted enamel, I saw uh, discolored teeth, and I had patients that came in that did not have very much access to fluoride. But in this day and age, where we've had so much access to refined sugars and chips, sports drinks, sodas, candy. Kids are active, they're moving around. They have so much exposure to ca uh, with these problems and that it can contribute to cavities. We need to have an extra layer of protection there. Now the key here is that fluoride is not the magic bullet. By itself, it's not gonna work for us in a properly regulated level, the right concentration, along with personal responsibility. We don't talk about that an awful lot, but we have to have responsibility for ourselves. If we have a reasonable diet, if we have good dental habits and fluoride, then we will have a very, very nice result. I can't tell you how important this is. This is for the poor people that don't have the opportunity to come here and speak before you. This is for the young children, for the elderly, everybody, the masses will benefit. Please support this, thank you. 
Mary Rose Tuhig, followed by Rome Armijo. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm Mary Rose Tuhig. I'm the president of the Albuquerque District Dental Society. Uh, I would, I'm just going to read this because I don't speak well, but um, I'm here on behalf of the District Dental Society applauding the Water Authority for voting to reinstitute supplemental fluoridation. The residents of Bernalillo County may now rejoin the sediment out of 10 Americans who received the benefits of fluoride through their public water system after several years of non-optimal fluoridation. Uh, we know that the recommended amount from the CDC is 0.7 milligrams per fluoride, of fluoride per liter of water for optimal care. Implementing this level of protection should, not, should be neither a political or, nor subjective uh, measure. Significant numbers of health care professionals have researched, consulted, and agreed on this level of fluoridation, and is, it is easily implemented and monitored. Though other fluoride-containing pro products, such as toothpaste, mouth rinses, and dietary supplements are available and contribute to the pre prevention and co control of tooth decay, community water fluoridation has been identified as the most cost-effective method of delivering fluoride to all, reducing tooth decay by 25% in children and adults. In a state where public health dollars are limited, the cost savings of water fluoridation is extremely valuable. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it is estimated, as we've heard, that for every dollar invested in community water fluoridation, there is a $38, save, a $38 savings in uh, dental treatment costs. Thank you to the Water Authority for recognizing the importance of water fluoridation and its contribution to the health of our community. As a side note, I had two uh, patients today, a six-year-old and an 18-year-old. The 18-year-old benefited most of his life um, from the water fluoridation. He had no decay, decay until recently in the last three years. The six-year-old has not um, benefited, obviously, from water fluoridation, and she had 10 cavities. They have 20, in 24 teeth, 10 of the uh, teeth had cavities. Thank you. Rome Armijo, followed by Carla Cope. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. I just um, wanted to state my comments here. I've been researching fluoride for about 16 years now. I'm 45 years old, and uh, fluoride has been shown to be a neurotoxin. It has uh, been used for years back in the day as the main ingredient for rat poison and a pesticide as well. I do agree that it does cause cancer as well, uh, as the people have stated tonight. And um, it has been found to be more toxic than lead as well, and slightly less toxic than arsenic. Dr. Dean Burke is a 34-year uh, PhD doctor for the National Cancer Institute. He, his comment is, in point of fact, fluoride causes more human cancer deaths and causes it faster than any other chemical. The um, fluoride containers that I have researched that go into the water facilities um, state toxic poison by ingestion, um, can damage heart, kidneys, bone, central nervous system, gastrointestinal system, and teeth in excess, of course. And I do have a picture here from many years back of the insecticide sodium fluoride. That's all I have for you tonight. I am totally against fluoride in the water because there's no way to regulate how much fluoride is going to be ingested. And I do believe topically it, it can be extremely beneficial, but orally, if we have working at 106 degrees outside, drinking a lot of water, there's no way to regulate how much water or, or how much fluoride our body is getting. Filtered drinks that you buy off the shelf at the grocery stores, they are not defluoridated. There's fluoride in a whole lot of different stuff, and there's no way to regulate how much your body is getting. Thank you. Carla Koch, followed by Pamela Turman. Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you. I am Dr. Carla Koch. I am a naturopathic physician and doctor of oriental medicine and a registered nurse with 20 years in um, um, medical care. I am against fluoridating the water supply. The primary cause of tooth decay is chewing on sugary foods, not on a lack of fluoride in our system. 
The CDC's Oral Health Division acknowledges that fluoride's main benefit comes from topical contact with the teeth, not from ingestion. Comprehensive data from the World Health Organization reveals there is no discernible difference in tooth decay between the minority of Western nations that fluoridate water and the majority that do not, as Dr. Jersik pointed out earlier in his chart. The FDA admits that fluoride is a form of medication intended to prevent tooth decay. Fluoride is not a nutrient. The public water supply is not an appropriate place to be adding a drug that is only proven to prevent dental caries when used topically, not systemically. There is growing evidence that fluoridated water can cause or contribute to a range of serious health problems. The most common of these include arthritis, damage to the developing brain, and reducing thyroid function. Patients in fluoridated communities have nearly twice the rates of hypothyroidism than non-fluoridated communities, according to a study from the British Medical Journal. The American Cancer Society has evaluated the research on fluoride and cancer rates several times with equivocal results, and each time comments on the paucity of quality research to offer a clear opinion. For the sake of public dental health, instead of spending $250,000 annually on fluoridating water, this money could instead go towards providing free or low-cost dental care, toothpaste and brushes, education on proper brushing technique in schools and on television, as well as improving the nutritional quality of foods in public schools while reducing the distribution of highly sugary foods, which directly increases cavities, obesity, and diabetes. Thank you. Pamela Terman, followed by Era Edward Ayub. Good evening, Madam Chairman and the Board. Um, I think everyone before me has touched on everything I have on my list, yeah. except. Talk into the mic. Sorry. I think um, everyone before me has touched on the negative effects of fluoride um, to our health, and so I won't go back through my whole list that I have, have on here, too. But one thing that hasn't been touched on is um, with so many people now enlightened to the dangers of fluoride in our water, if it's to be put back in, thousands of health conscious people will be turning to reverse osmosis to take it out. This is the only filtering system that removes it. For every gallon of water filtered with reverse osmosis, six gallons of water is wasted in the filtering process. In New Mexico, this is just not a smart move when water conservation is of such high importance. A better way to spend this money would be toward nutritional education, especially for our children, which would improve dental health along with better all-over health for our children and our communities. I don't think anyone should be forced to drink fluoridated water. Thank you. Edward Ayub, followed by Dr. J. L. And I cannot read his last name. Okay. You're next. Hello, I'm Edward Ayub. I'm a design engineer since 1979, helped design one of the first fluoride treatment systems in the semiconductor industry. And I've been in New Mexico uh, much, much of my life designing high purity water systems and wastewater systems. <clears throat> I think some of the most important things you heard today to make a decision was the graph that showed 22 countries getting better and better. So any study, you see the general population is going to get better. When you have natural occurring fluoride in your water, why add more? Many communities are only injecting 0.5 ppm anyway. Let's do the math. If the math doesn't work, it's smoke and mirrors. How many ppm are in, a, in toothpaste? 1,500 ppm of fluoride in this Colgate box, 0.15%. So why, if 0.1500 ppm works, what's 0.7 ppm going to do? Let's drink some water. How much of that water touched my teeth? Very little. If it touched anything, it touched the inside of my teeth, not the outside. Try that at home. If you have 0.7 ppm, and most of it's going down your esophagus and your stomach and your liver and your intestines, it's not good for you. If you're bathing with it, it's not good for you. The CDC has a recommendation. Their recommendation went from 1.2 to 0.7 ppm. It went down for a reason, and that's because fluoride is a toxic chemical. I received this award for designing a fluoride treatment system to remove fluoride from wastewater. The CDC also publishes 
a warning, a hazardous warning on the very chemical you plan to inject. It says, don't inhale it, don't get it on your skin, don't get it in your eyes, and don't ingest it. Hello, why are we adding fluoride to all the water so that maybe possibly a little bit will go over our teeth and get on our, te our teeth enamel? It's not gonna happen. As you know, most kids who don't brush their teeth have a biofilm on their teeth. So even if the fluoride is in the water, it's not gonna touch the enamel. It just doesn't make sense. The math doesn't work. I think your money's better spent with education. Fluoride does work on topical treatments. It's great, but for ingesting it, putting it in our water treatment, putting it in our lawns and gardens, it's gonna stay there forever. Fluoride is an element. It's been here for 10 million years. It'll be here for another 10 million years. It does not break down. It's an element, just like gold or silver. Thank you. That's <coughs> Joe Bias, B-A-L-L-E-S. -L -L uh, thank you, Madam Chair Pena and uh, board members for the opportunity to have this discussion. I, uh, I've been in practice uh, in the same location at Edith and Central for 37 years. I've seen people from all walks of life and all ages. And uh, I'm now into my second week as the president of the New Mexico Dental Association. And I want to express to you our sustained and unreserved support for supplemental fluoridation for setting the maximum allowable fluoridation level at the optimal effective standard of seven parts per million. The science, to me at least, is pretty clear. The standard is also supported by the Albuquerque District Dental Society, the American Dental Association, the Center for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, the American Medical Association, and many others, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and they said this, tooth decay is the most common chronic disease of childhood, and water fluoridation is one of the most important public health initiatives. Water fluoridation is beneficial for reducing and controlling tooth decay and oral health in both children and adults. The American Association of Public Health Dentistry issued a strong endorsement in support for fluoridation of all community water systems as a safe and effective public health measure for the prevention of tooth decay. The last six United States Surgeon Generals have endorsed fluoridation for all communities. The New Mexico Board of Dental Health Care supports the fluoridation efforts. We have a crisis in the state when it comes to tooth decay, particularly in children. Our governor supports it. The legislature would support it. They're having a hard time finding the money uh, uh, for prevention. Um, and I'll say one thing because I'm running out of time here. I just want you to know that the American Dental Association, Association, the New Mexico Dental Association, spends a lot of time in protecting the public health. We support that. And I'm gonna tell you one more thing before I leave. That is in 37 years of practice on Edith and Central, I've never encountered one person or read one chart that claims that they have health issues due to fluoridation. Thank you very much. That, that was our last speaker. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate all you coming out um, this evening. Uh, this will be on our August agenda, correct, Mr. Sanchez? So with um, seeing no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.